Thank you. A very warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the Berkman Klein Center. Uh, I'm Robert Farris. I'm the research director there, and I'm really thrilled to uh, act as the very brief host for this uh, at the occasion of the launch of Bruce Schneier's new book, Click Here to Kill Everyone. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're going to tell us that indeed that's not true, that we can't yet do that. Um, so uh, I think you all know Bruce. Bruce is a longtime um, member of the Berkman Klein family. He's a cryptographer, an expert in security. He is uh, probably perhaps one of the, a handful of the clearest and most incisive thinkers on cybersecurity out there. Uh, and more than that, he's really, really good at thinking about systems and institutions and understanding how technology intersects, sorry, uh, how technology intersects uh, with political and social structures. Uh, He's a very prolific author. I'm going to have to get a new bookshelf that's a, like a Bruce Schneier section, which is really a, a very good problem to have. Um, he's going to be in conversation today with Abby Jakes. Abby is a postdoc at MIT. She's a philosopher who is working on the ethics of AI. And without further ado, I'm going to turn over the floor to Bruce and Abby. Welcome. Mr. Thomas, so there are chairs. There's a chair there. There's a chair there. There's a chair there. And who, who has a chair next to them? Raise your hand. Okay, so, right, so there are a bunch of chairs, so please please come in and sit I, down. I, and I also, I forgot some um, housekeeping. So uh, number one, you are all under surveillance. Know that. The can this is being filmed and recorded. Uh, <laughs> uh, number two, uh, for folks out there that want to um, lob a question in over Twitter, uh, the hashtag is BKC Harvard. Uh, and number three is after this talk, books uh, will be for sale probably over in that general vicinity where Ruben is. Anything else I'm forgetting? That's perfect. Okay. All, right. All yours. Okay, so uh, I wanted to just start by laying some groundwork. So Bruce's really terrific book. Um, everyone, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. Bruce's excellent book calls our attention to a crucial inflection point. So we've gotten used to dealing with computer security. We know, and insecurity, we know that sometimes we have data loss, sometimes we have data breaches. So, you know, we try to protect against identity theft and we have backups, things like this. But Bruce points out that we're entering really a new era. And this new era is characterized by the fact that now everything is becoming a computer. So all kinds of things that used to have computers in them, or maybe didn't even have computers in them, now are computers with various other systems attached to them. So our phones, obviously, but also cars and power plants and all kinds of other systems, airplanes. And these are things that operate in the physical, not just the digital world. And that ends up making a really big difference. A hacked car can lose control of its brakes on the highway. And a hacked power plant or a hacked water treatment plant can cause blackouts or public health emergencies. And a hacked bioprinter could release a deadly virus into a hospital. So not only that, if all these kinds of hacks were carried out at scale, if we suddenly could hack all the cars or all the airplanes or all the power plants, we could have really catastrophic new kinds of risks. So Bruce calls our attention to this moment and he very carefully lays out what it would take to protect ourselves from this, what a better, more secure, networked world would look like and the kinds of forces that are gonna make that difficult to achieve, and then how we might navigate in the imperfect situation in which we find ourselves. Um, so he's really thinking about how there are technological solutions for the majority of these kinds of problems, but the real challenges come on the policy side, the political will, the incentive structures to getting the changes to actually happen. So Bruce, is there anything you wanna say about what's going on in the book that I haven't sort of generally? I, I think that's, that's the crux of it. I'm trying to write about the changing environment. That, you know, the, and we all know this, that the, the old way of dealing with computers is to stare at a screen. And the new way to deal with computers is going to be to interact with them in our environment. And that'll be our refrigerators, our cars, other appliances and toys and systems. You know, I mean, we're interacting with computers in this room. Right? This, we're, we're, being, we're being recorded, but you know, I don't see them. And that's the new way to interact with them. So there's this pervasiveness of these systems. 
and then there's this new power these systems have. Right? They, they, they directly affect the physical environment. And, and this is automation, this is autonomy, this is physical agency. And that sort of changes. We've had all these assumptions are a bad word, kind of like negotiated detente with security. You know, we're, we're doing authentication this way, and we're doing patching this way, and we know software's not that great, but we're managing in this way. And, and, and that's all worked really well, but when you move into the new environment, you know, maybe they don't work so well anymore. And that's what I'm exploring. That's, I, I think, and I think that's a really important change. And it does mean that those of us who sort of know security have a lot to teach. The other parts of the of our ecosystem that aren't don't have that history. Yeah, yeah. So because we're here at Berkman Klein and we have people here who think a lot about policy, I wanted to ask you a question about what levers are available in the policy domain. So you talk quite a bit how you think that um, it's very important to get this right. That we're going to need good government doing good. Um, you really think that. This is a place where market-based solutions or voluntary self-regulation are just not going to be enough, as you see it. And it seems very plausible in the context of the kinds of solutions you're proposing. Um, but of course, you're also very clear-eyed about the challenges that that presents in our moment. I think I may be even more pessimistic than you about our moment. <laughs> um, you mentioned that, uh, look, once these systems start killing people, governments often think that's the moment to, to regulate. I sort of worry that that will be an excuse to make things much worse. <laughs> um, but I wonder, if we're, if we're worried about the, the sort of federal level, if you think that there are other avenues. You mentioned you know, that states often are doing better um, on these things. Massachusetts, our home, and California sometimes. Um, and so do you think that there are, is enough leverage, say, at a state level kind of um, plane of action, since software is this right once run everywhere, the way that the GDPR is seeming to have some effects because the EU's regulations are trickling outward. Do you think that we could tackle this by trying to go around something like a federal institution and, and use state levers? Or do you think that we're just going to have to try to make federal solutions work? I'm curious where you think yeah, we I could mean, locate yeah, these right, things. I, mean, I think the answer is going to be all of the above. Yeah. I mean, right now, I, we, have, we know we have a pretty dysfunctional federal government, and it's not the place to look for, uh, for answers. And I think this, you know, software has this interesting advantage that it is right one cell everywhere. And so the car I buy in the United States is not the same car I buy in Mexico. Right? Environmental laws are different. The manufacturers tune the engines to the, the local laws. But the software I buy here is the same software I buy everywhere. Because it's much easier for a software manufacturer to write it once and sell it everywhere. So if, they, if there is a law passed in California, right? California has a bill that's going to be signed of a very small change in IoT security. You can no longer have default passwords. Right? Of the 50 horrible things that are in security, this is one of them. It's not going to make a big difference. It'll make a little difference, but it'll make a difference. And if a company wants to sell a product in California, they'll remove the default password. They're not going to have a separate build of the software for us here in Massachusetts. That makes no sense. So we will all benefit. Right? Similarly, the EU passes uh, some law regulating security of interconnected toys, which they are about to do. There was uh, pretty, some pretty bad security interconnected dolls that allowed for you know, super creepy spying on children. And uh, that's going to be fixed, and we will benefit from that. I mean, I'm sure the, the extra old toys will be dumped on our market because they can't be sold in Europe. But after we buy them, they'll be the better ones. And so that's something we really don't have in the privacy realm. Right? You know, so GDPR, the big European uh, data protection regulation, Facebook very much wants to figure out who is under that jurisdiction, who isn't. Because they can... If they, if they can, if they can differentiate offerings, right, they can spy on the non-Europeans more and, and make more profit. That, doesn't, that same desire to circumvent doesn't exist in safety. In safety, all you have is the desire not to spend the money to fix. But once you're forced to spend the money to fix, you fix it everywhere. Right? The refrigerator will be improved everywhere. The thermostat will be improved everywhere. Even the car will in a way you don't have in privacy. 
So I think that gives us an advantage in, in this particular area, which we don't have when, when someone's trying to steal our data for profit. So I want to talk about something that is an interest that you and I share, um, AI. <laughs> um, and so your focus is really on um, bad actors, mm -hmm. um, hacking, um, or even just corporations sort of under the influence of surveillance capitalism, <laughs> exploiting their users. But when we think about the AI kind of contexts, often people think about the kind of stuff that actually my work focuses on, which is more the unintended kind of problems where, whoops, the autonomous uh, vehicle won't do what we expected, the helper robot is out of control, um, or there's bias and things built in that we didn't anticipate. So I'm curious what you think the specific risks are around AI and whether you think that there are differences between the kind of domain of specifically bad actors and sort of the more unintended consequences kind of stuff. You know, I mean, and I, I, it's a debate that always, I think, exists in, in the security field. Is security a subset of safety or is safety a subset of security? Exactly. Right? And, and what you're thinking about are mistakes, things that happened randomly. What I'm thinking about is an intelligent, malicious adversary. Now, it's different in defenses. I mean, if you are in, I don't know, doing environmental safety and you need to secure buildings against hurricanes, you can do things, and, and there's lots of things you can read about how to make buildings hurricane-proof, you, but you know deep down that the hurricanes will never change what they do based on your, sec uh, on your security. Right? The hurricanes don't get smarter. Right? They don't adapt. That's very different if you're doing you know, ATM machine security where your adversary immediately adapts and immediately figures out how to circumvent what you're doing. So, I mean, things are very related. And actually, when you get to things like crashing cars, even as by malice, it is more the realm of safety. I mean, it's going to be the safety regulators that are going to look at the bad actors taking over cars. It won't be the security people. In some ways, they're very similar. You look at uh, some, uh, some security events that after the event happens, the safety and security response are the same. So, I mean, uh, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, one, one of the stories I would tell is, I think in the 1940s, a plane crashed into the Empire State Building. Right? It was an accident. It wasn't on purpose. But if you think about everything that happened the moment after the crash was exactly the same. Right? We need firefighters, we need rescue people, you know, we need people who understand how buildings stay up. You know, well, everything was identical. So if you're an emergency responder, you don't care whether it was a deliberately set bomb or someone accidentally you know, punctured a fuel line and it exploded. It, it, it's the same response. So I think there's a lot of overlap in, in, in safety versus security. But it's all, the difference is going to be in that, in that adaptation. You know, that the, the bad actor, right, programmers, you know, don't, won't make different and new mistakes because you've protected against the old mistakes. So they'll keep making mistakes in some Gaussian bell curve of mistake space. I don't know, I'm making this up, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, I think that the overlap point seems right to me. I'm not super clear that there's a bright line. I mean, right. you mentioned at one point that the, of the catastrophic risks that scare you, the one that really worries you is a criminal attack that sort of gets out of hand. And we've seen some of these before where there's a sort of a bad actor, but then what they thought they were doing ends up being right. not what they actually did. And um, even, you know, Mirai Botnet and things like this that um, it looks like these are going to be, you know, cases where there's sort of a combination of these effects. So it seems right that we shouldn't think that there's a, a big separation between the bad actor cases necessarily and the, the safety and the security cases and the inadvertent cases and the bad actor cases. Yeah, and, and we share the same issues in, in, uh, in transparency and, and exactly. right, right, systems that will adapt and, and to a point where they you know, can't be understood. Uh, who do you hold accountable right. for, uh, for when an algorithm does something which you would normally hold human accountable? Which, which human do you pick? What do you do if there isn't an obvious human? Right. What do you do if the human says, yeah, I wrote that algorithm, but it's way different now, and I don't know what it's doing, and I'm not in charge, and don't blame me for that. It's gone weird. Right. Now what? Can you hold an algorithm into account? What does it mean to 
incarcerate an algorithm, can you? <laughs> hey, 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 you know, can, maybe we can program it that it doesn't like that. I don't know. <laughs> you, you have to solve this stuff. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Do robots have feelings? Um, I mean, you talk well, about well, how... Or can we pretend they do <laughs> right. in some useful way, even if they yeah. don't? I mean, and you've talked about how the courts have been reluctant to hold people responsible for vulnerabilities, programmers responsible for vulnerabilities, when they were exploited, that it's tended to be, oh, it's the hacker who did the bad thing. It's not the programmer who put the vulnerability in there. And you might worry that there'd be analogous problems with assigning responsibility in this domain. I mean, this is worth looking up. The, I mean, the history of software liabilities in the United States. You know, we, de we deliberately decided not to hold programmers responsible. And the belief was that that would be a huge detriment to innovation, that we would, we would stick the proximal cause, yeah. right? So, you know, Windows is lousy, uh, someone finds a vulnerability, a hacker breaks into your machine and steals your money, right? We could blame a lot of people in that chain, but we're going to blame the hacker. You know, then we choose deliberately not to blame Microsoft for selling you a shoddy piece of goods and pretending it's not, right? We're not going to even blame the person who discovered the vulnerability and, and published it. But we're going to blame that proximal cause. I, I think that, that holds less well. This is, again gets the change into where computers are. That'll hurt, hold less well in a car. You know, we, uh, we have a lot of case law that, that it, when a car has a, uh, a flaw in it and someone crashes, we assign a lot of liability to way back the manufacturer of that car, of that part, and, and some, of course, to the driver and the road condition and maybe, you know, whoever designed the bad intersection. You know, we can think of a lot of other, you know, causes on that chain. But we do go back in a way we don't in, in software. And I, I just see this changing as, you know, where you have all these rules about software. We already have rules on cars and medical devices and consumer goods and appliances and all those things. These rules aren't going away. As software moves into this world, these rules are going to... I think going to chew their way back. Let's hope so, right? Yeah, it's, let's <laughs> hope so. Um, so uh, one thing, sort of a small point, but I found it striking. One thing late in the book you mentioned is that you think that we need to sort of demilitarize the internet. We need to think about changing the sort of models and metaphors we use for thinking about cybersecurity. And in particular, you say that this militarized talk isn't necessarily the most productive, that maybe what would make more sense is talking about um, pollution or public health or these kinds of different models that naturally suggest a different way of relating to problems we find in our networked world and also of solving them. And it struck me because another theme in the book is the way that um, it's very tempting and common to focus on offense rather than defense. And that feels to me like a particular kind of militarized, kind of macho posturing kind of mindset that's cued by this particular way of thinking. And that if we switched over to something like a public health model, we might get a really different intuitive sense of how to approach these problems. And also it would help us bring certain kinds of problems under the same umbrella. I think about the way that something like Cambridge Analytica kind of problems look like unauthorized illegitimate experimentation on human <laughs> subjects. <laughs> and you might think that it's worth thinking about these kinds of models that we use to, to, to structure our thought about these issues. And this is hard. I mean, the, 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 the military attack defense model is pervasive yeah. in, in security. I use it all the time. It's, it is how we talk about these issues. And I think it does really limit the way we think about them. We think about it in terms of attack and defense and this very adversarial nature yeah. and a public health model, you know, it, it, just, it just gives us different tools to, to think about things. You know, I think of, uh, of cyber peace, uh, I'm really channeling Camille Francois, who many of us remember, and very much talked about this other way of thinking, that, that when you talk about cyber war, even if you don't like it, you're buying into the frame that there is this natural hostility. And there is, kind of, right? I mean, I, I, I see it. I know it's there. But you can use a, pu a public health model, which does have attackers and defenders and bad actors and good actors. But you know, we don't think of it in that same 
militaristic term. This really is kind of idealistic. I think right now, you know, what we can do is, ex is expand the frame of discussion. I don't think we can go to US Cyber Command and say, surprise, you're now like the NHS. <laughs> and they'd say, great. <laughs> Right, I mean, <laughs> darn. <laughs> but you know, it, it, it is a it is a step in that, and I, I think I think that's important. I think these sort of other ways of thinking are going to give us windows into answers that we don't necessarily have right now. And again, no time soon, but you know, these problems aren't going away. So let's talk about power for a second. <laughs> um, it looks like, with regard to these problems, most of the power resides with governments and corporations. And you bring out very well how those are precisely the locus of many of the problems. Um, and there's this hope that government power can be the way to mitigate and manage these risks. So I'm wondering how can we leverage government power in the right ways when it is itself so much part of the problem? Is it that we need to, you know, is this just a remember to vote moment? Is this a, we need to cultivate sites of power outside of uh, governments and corporations? Is this a man the barricades moment? Like, what do you think about how we can disrupt the power structure enough to actually get these changes to happen? This is hard, otherwise we would have done it already. Uh, I, I tend to think that our best answers lie in multiple power sources watching each other. Right. We know that unbridled government power is bad. We know that unbridled corporate power is bad. But if we can get the two of them watching each other, they can keep each other in check. And it can't be just the two of them. There's a, a strong role for civil society, for NGOs, to monitor both. There's a strong role for journalism to monitor both. And uh, in any robust political uh, environment, there are multiple political parties that are monitoring each other. Right? There are multiple sources of corporate power that are monitoring each other. Right? I mean, the problems we have today, I mean, we can very broadly you know, blame on the, the, the large monopolistic powers that don't really have the checks that you'd have in a more uh, dynamic and fluid market. The, at least the United States, very narrow political spectrum of, you know, okay political thought. Right? You have, we have a, we have a far right party and a middle right party, right? But which, which really limits the, uh, the amount of, of monitoring they're doing on each other. For, the, for NGOs, the press, these are hard issues. Uh, plug, people notice that uh, Julia Angwin has a new media venture. This is, this is exciting. Uh, she's left ProPublica. The markup. Uh, yeah, with Jeff Larson and is going to do data-driven investigative journalism. Right? This is fantastic. Right? This is something we... And this will serve as a check against some of these problems with algorithms and autonomy and, and dis automatic decision-making that, that we wrestle with. I mean, that is a... A, a phenomenal thing. We need more of those. We need dozens of those. I mean, you know, every, every time uh, we get an email from Ron Debert, right, telling us of another great piece of investigative uh, computer forensics he's done, exposing government abuses of power, sort of surveillance and control in various countries, right? And, you know, we need dozens of those. And, I, I mean, there isn't a good answer here. And we want to push power levels down take our autonomy and push it up. But, you know, hand wavy, we need uh, more distributed power. And I think that's how we get that. I, you know, this is, you know, again, I'll, I will turn to your political philosophers and, right, how, how do we do that? How do we, how do we make government work in the 21st century? You know, what does a, uh, what does a representative democracy look like in this century? I mean, I, you, you could really make the argument that the current constitutional democracy is the best form of government mid 18th century technology could produce. <laughs> right? You know, because when travel and communications are hard, we need to pick one of us to go all the way over there and make laws on our behalf. That makes a lot of sense. But now, travel and communications are easy. So, 
maybe that makes less sense. But what will replace it? All right, we're going to open up for questions in a minute, but I have one more question for you. So you talk about the need for the Internet Plus, as you call it, to be resilient. And that connects to something I've been thinking about, which is that I think we're going to need to spend more time thinking about how to make our systems fail gracefully. Yes. So part of the problem with the sort of Google Photos debacle wasn't just that black faces weren't recognized as, at the same rate and as well as white male faces. It was also the particular way the failure happened. It was that they were a photo of a black face was classified as a photo of a gorilla. That's a whole different thing from differences in rates of, right. oh, I can tell that's the same person or something. And I think that especially in this new era that you've called our attention to where all of a sudden these systems are reaching out into the real world in various ways, the sort of there's no undo button once we've got this problem in a, in a 757. Right. This failing gracefully is going to be an important feature. And is that part of what you have in mind when you talk about resilience? And maybe you could just say a little bit more about what you're thinking there. I mean, it is very much. And, and we know how systems fail gracefully. I mean, airplanes have I mean, sort of two ways. I mean, there's the airplane way, where there are multiple ways to do something. So if, if the landing gear fails to deploy through the button of deploy landing gear, there are like two or three backup systems, including you know going to, going under on the bottom of the plane and hand cranking them and, and bringing them down. Right? So that is a way that systems can fail gracefully. That there are multiple backup systems. The other main way we do it is is this building, which doesn't really have multiple ways to hold the roof up, but it's just been over engineered. If, if we think that the load is going to be X, that we design the struts to take two X load. Right? And both of those are, are ways to, to fail safely. Uh, your car, you know, as much as possible, fails safely. Right? If you if you if you take your foot, or you take your hands off the steering wheel, it doesn't like erratically glow left and right. You can imagine a steering wheel is like that. You got to hold it steady. But no, it, it naturally is steady because that is a you know a, a better way for it to fail. I think we need to start doing that with our systems that these, the, this fail catastrophically isn't going to work. And that's really what I'm talking about in, in, in the cover, right? This is the, the title. I mean, that's a little bit science fiction. Not really. But the notion that you could have a system where in one click you ruin it for everybody is how our computers work. So uh, I don't know if people followed. There's a lock company called Amity. They make uh, locks for hotel rooms, and these are uh, uh, those key cards. And uh, I think it was earlier this year, there was a vulnerability discovered. I think it was last year, maybe because I think it's in the book. A vulnerability in, 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 in their product. What it means is every single hotel room that is secured by this lock is now insecure. Surprise, right? Hey, everything. And that's a particular mode of failure for computers. And the, they do not fail gracefully. The way you fix this is you walk up to each lock in the world one at a time and fix it. Right? That is not failing gracefully. Right? That is failing catastrophic. That is failing maximally catastrophically. And, and, and I think that, that is the wrong way of thinking. So we and we so we do need sort of this better way. Because we're not going to design absolute security. I mean, nothing is absolutely secure. These systems are too complex. But maybe we can contain the security. Right? After the, uh, the, bl the blackout in 2004, we lost power in the northeast quadrant of the United States and the south southeast quadrant of Canada. Uh, the power grid of the nation was redesigned. So you wouldn't have those kind of catastrophic failures. Because the failure was uh, a particular uh, K, uh, power line in mid-Ohio. And that started a cascade of, of failures that was a huge blackout. We try to limit those. Uh, airlines have finally realized that they can rejigger how planes are scheduled, that if there's a weather failure in a certain city, it doesn't affect the entire country. It just affects planes going in and out of that city. And these are ways to to decouple, to decentralize, to disengage in order to fail more safely and securely. And there's a lot here. I mean, you talked about uh, some of the tech 
problems. And, you, and, and there are a lot of tech solutions that aren't being deployed for, for the, all these, these policy reasons. And, but there's a lot of tech solutions we don't have yet. But what I tell people is that, I mean, this stuff is hard, but it's send a person to the moon hard. It's not faster than light travel hard. Right? We can do this if we have the economic incentives. What we're missing are the incentives for companies to do it better. Right? Equifax, one year anniversary a couple of weeks ago, big deal. Everybody's personal information in the country was stolen. Big press event. Legislators were annoyed. I, I testified in front of the House, one of the committees, and there were angry legislators on both sides of the aisle saying, this cannot stand, something must be done. Fast forward one year, nothing was done, zero. Right? The lesson you learn is skimp on security, hope for the best. If the worst happens, weather the press storm, get beaten up by Congress, you know, verbally, and then nothing happens. Right? Facebook is good. the same thing's going to happen. Don't think anything is going to be different. And, and that's unfortunate. On that note, I think it's time to open it up for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are mics. There's a question right there. I'll stick. Yeah. Sorry, I'll stick. Wait, let's uh, let's get to you. Get you the mic. Thanks. Uh, that was incredibly interesting. I'm uh, Uli Köppen. I'm a Niemann Fellow. I'm a journalist, and I'm interested in algorithmic accountability reporting. And I was I had my little party when I learned yesterday the 20 million uh, grant to uh, the markup you mentioned. And I would be interested in could you expand a little bit on the role of uh, journalism that has played in this field uh, up uh, up till now, if uh, there has been a positive example to change uh, the field of this uh, interest, and if you had a wish list on which issues journalists uh, should focus uh, during the that. next year. <laughs> I, I can talk a bit about the history. Uh, I mean, there have been some great wins. Uh, Julia Angwin is, has done some great reporting on, on racism of algorithms that uh, do bail and parole decisions. Uh, this have uh, Kashmir Hill, she's also done reporting on algorithms and uh, discriminations and biases and opacity. Uh, Frank Pasquale has written about, there's a book called The Black Box Society, about algorithms and, uh, and lack of transparency and how that's bad for society. I, I, right now, I think journalists are the only people holding algorithms and algorithm designers uh, to account. I don't think, I mean, we, we, maybe in Europe there is some government accountability, but I don't think it's very much. So, yeah, I mean, journalists are, are, are what we got here. You know, I, I guess non-journalists, uh, um, Latanya Sweeney yeah. here at Harvard has done some great work on algorithm. I mean, she's the one who proved that uh, some of Google's uh, rec uh, ads were, were racist. Yeah, in, in, like, in horrifying ways, in ways that you just look and say, I mean, don't you have, don't you pay attention? Yeah, I would add that um, the, the examples that Bruce mentioned are doing such important work, and it really is one of the only <laughs> sort of areas where this stuff is being called attention to in a really public way, and it's, it's vital. I would say if we're thinking about what journalists should be doing, the other part of your question, I would say precisely focusing on the kinds of issues that those pieces are about. So there's also a temptation in other kinds, parts of the press to focus on what Bruce likes to call movie plot scenarios, the really wild, extreme disaster scenarios. And I think that that's not helpful in terms of people understanding what the te technological challenges actually are um, or what the real plausible locations of harm are. And so focusing on these not as sexy kinds, you know, in certain ways, things that you don't feel like Michael Bay would turn them into a film, um, these kinds of scenarios about bail and parole, lending, even things like hotel room keys, just to get people who have a sense of the ordinary objects, Admit that kind admissions of work. Admissions universities, I mean, Harvard yeah. doesn't. Many universities use automatic scoring mechanisms. Uh, you know, we know uh, Palantir has been hired by the U.S. government to use big data analytics to find illegal aliens. Yeah. That sounds horrifying. Yeah. 
Yeah, but, but, but you know, can we understand? What's your false positive rate? What's your false negative rate? How, you know, how good are, are you? I mean, do you, you know, what sorts of controls? What sorts of uh, legal protections? What sorts of uh, appeal is there? You know, any of those things. I mean, there's, there's a lot. Algorithms are going to do, they're going to make more and more decisions. And they're going to be hidden. You know, you're, you're going to be denied a government service. You're going to be denied admission to some kind of corporate event. So you're going to see a certain kind of ad when you go onto Facebook and not see another ad. Algorithms make all those decisions. And they make them using some. Uh, David Weinberger isn't here. He sent a great little essay recently on five definitions of fairness. Right? Go read that. Right? This stuff is robustly hard. But you know, a little bit of transparency could go a long way. Am I doing it? So can I slip a question in while, while the running thing? You're kind of so, in charge. Uh, you can have your watch. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, Bruce, you had written several years ago about the feudal internet. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if your thinking on that has changed as we broaden. Kind of it scope. is not. And by feudal, I mean, we mean feudal with a D, not with a T. <laughs> <laughs> and by this, I mean the internet where you have a protector. And you, we know this, right? Some of us are Apple people. We have iPhones and, I, and uh, Apple computers. Our data is in iCloud. They keep our calendar and our email and our photos. And in a sense, they are our protector. Others of us use Google in the same way, or Microsoft. And, and this is almost like we are serfs to these feudal lords, that they offer us protection in exchange for all of our data. And Kind of annoyingly, it's not half bad a deal, <laughs> right? Because doing it yourself is hard. You don't want to be a Ronin. You don't want to, right? You want to you know, be, ha have a protector. I don't think that's changing. I mean, as we move the Internet of Things, we are seeing these, uh, these big ecosystems, right? And now we, the fight now is, is who's the controller, right? Amazon Echo is all about being the central hub for all the things in your home. I mean, right now, if you have an IoT anything, you're controlling it on this. Right? Your phone is the controlling hub, which means it gets to set the rules. Coffee maker doesn't. It's just a coffee maker, right? If it, but if it wants to have its app in the iPhone store, because if it doesn't, nobody's going to buy it, it has to, set the, it has to follow Apple's rules. So Amazon wants the Echo to be that. Google is, is using Android and whatever its voice thingy is. Right? Everyone wants to be that, that, thro that point of throttle. Right? That, and that's all about control. And that's another going to be another point of feudalism. Right? You will say, you know, I don't know anything about these things, but, but they got an iPhone app. I trust that Apple has done some vetting. Right? And this is good as long as our feudal lords are benevolent. Right? This, this goes bad if they turn evil. History of corporations doesn't bode well. <laughs> but yes, this is, that's what this is all about. Hi, my name's uh, Parker Abel. I'm a secure and assured systems engineer at Draper's, Draper Labs. Um, MITRE recently released the uh, most common weakness list, weakness enumeration list. Um, and the top 25 most common weaknesses for, for systems are hardware-based. And all we have discussions about are policy issues and software issues. But the more software you add, the more insecure that a system gets. So that's why DARPA has started a challenge for inherently secure processors. Mm -hmm. It's actually been won, and they've been created. So the defense industry is really concerned about hardware-based security. And, and often we see you know, military being ahead of the curve in terms of uh, advancement. Mm -hmm. But what is it going to take for industry to start thinking, OK, hardware-based security is crucial, and we actually need to focus on it? Because it, I work on it every day, and what I see is you know, everyone's plugging fingers in a hole in the dam, but we need to reface the dam. So I talk about that. Uh, and I think the problem is the reason no one talks about it is it's insurmountably hard. That, this is, I think of this supply chain security. That you know, the hard, and you, so you saw this in, in public debate recently with uh, should we as the United States buy Kaspersky antivirus? Should we trust a Russian antivirus program? And also in the debate of should we buy 
uh, ZTE phones and Huawei network equipment? Should we buy Chinese-made uh, devices that plug into our network? And you know, that's an important question. It is not, of course, not just the US. Uh, 2014, China banned Kaspersky. They also banned Symantec, because US-based can't be trusted. Uh, India has banned uh, Chinese-made hardware. Uh, 1997, there were debates in the United States whether we should trust Checkpoint, an Israeli company with our security. Uh, and remember uh, Mujahideen Secrets, an encryption program written uh, by ISIS, because of course you can't trust Western encryption. But you know that really is just a discussion of what country the company that the product is made is located. Right? This is not a U.S. made product. It's gone, right? This is made in one of several Asian countries. The chips are made in one of several, I think again, Asian countries, different ones probably. The programmers are probably carrying a couple hundred different passports. And, and any one of those steps in that chain can subvert the security of this. There's a great paper last year, you can break an iPhone security with a malicious replacement screen. Surprise. So, right, these hardware problems, the reason they're hard is the industry is deeply international. No one will ever buy a US-only iPhone. It will cost 10 times the price, and nobody wants it. So the reason nobody's thinking about it, because no one wants to, because it's hard. I mean, even the US military just kind of pretends, but it's gonna, it buys chips from, from China, because it has no choice. And yes, uh, another paper, it's about four years ago, you could have a, uh, you, you, you make a mask, for, you design your chip and you make a mask, basically, which is what you give to the chip maker to you know, make me a couple of million of these. And they can take your mask and slip another layer in that you don't know about, make your design, where you get back something that you can test from today to tomorrow. It's exactly what you asked for, nothing more. It has been subverted. You don't know it. Right? So that's doable. I mean, if I was a country, I would be doing that to other countries. Right? Wouldn't you? I mean, duh. <laughs> So yeah, th these are big problems. And what will it take to get people to, uh, to think about it? I think it's going to be a disaster. And even then, it is so, it's really hard to think about something that is expensive and nobody wants to. You have to be forced to. And this one is super expensive. We really have built a very international uh, tech industry that gets our expertise in programming from all over the world. Our expert, the expertise in, in hardware, in software, in fab. We go where uh, labor is cheapest to do some parts. We go where labor is smartest to do other parts. We go on the net to do parts that are distributed. And nobody wants to do anything about that. That is a terrible answer. And I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you're thinking about it. I'm glad somebody is. <laughs> I want to pause and give my... Uh, you, you mentioned that the, the, the title in the cover. So the, the title's mine. I'm so proud of it. Uh, I, I, I'm happy with the cover. I'll show you. I'll give you two reasons I like it. One, there's a button that says OK. It's only one button. It says OK. And it's clearly not OK. <laughs> and two, it looks like this thing has been throwing error messages for the past hour, and no one's been reading them. Right, so so uh, the cover has curb appeal which is what we want. I, I have actually seen it in airports, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and and this, so this is my theory of, of book writing. Of, 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 and uh, we might have another uh, book writing seminar in spring. I'm, I'm thinking about it. So th there is a chain of, of, of readers. The title gets you to read the subtitle. The subtitle gets you to read this stuff, the flap, also known as the Amazon summary, and that gets you to read the book. Right? So it is, it is very much a, uh, a chain. At any step, I can lose my reader. It all has to work, or I don't get a reader. So you go for, I mean, this is my first ever clickbait title. <laughs> and, and, and I kind of back off from it in like page three of the book. I mean, you're just like, all right, I mean, I got you here, but let's, you know, let's be reasonable, guys. 
but it really is, you know, because I need that flow. Right? No one, unless they kind of know me and are just blindly buying an Xnaria book, right? But I don't, that, that's not the reader I'm trying to hook. I'm trying to hook a reader that will go through those steps. So I tend to like a provocative title, a descriptive subtitle, a slightly sensationalist but not inaccurate <laughs> flap, yeah. and then a kick-ass good book. Right? That's 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 my recommendation if you are writing a book. Mission accomplished. <laughs> you've been you've been quite patient. Right. Is oligopoly our friend or our foe when we're trying to deal with this kind of problem? For instance, it seems like it sounds like there's like one manufacturer of hotel keys, and they fail, and every hotel in the world fails. If there were 20 of them, uh, the failure would be more contained. On the other hand, imagine if there were 20, opera 20 dominant operating systems instead of three or four uh, for your phones or your computers. It seems like that would make things harder to fix. So how do, how do you see this? Well, this, this, is, this is the trade-off of, of between having a few and investing and having many and uh, having some kind of, of safety in numbers. Right? I mean, you see this in reproductive strategy. The two basic systems of reproductive security the one is what we primates tend to use, is have very few offspring and invest a lot of resources in, in bringing them to adulthood. And then there's a lobster method, which is have a couple of million offspring, ignore them completely, and play the numbers game. Yeah. Right? Both work. Yeah. Now, we're good, likely going to have some hybrid, because there are costs to multiple things that aren't security costs, right? Multiple OSs is annoying for a lot of reasons, for interoperability. And, and in some places, we don't. We, we don't want, we want everyone to use TCP IP. We want everyone to use PDF files, because we want to have that, that ability to transfer. We want everyone to use the same photo format and video format. Otherwise, we're not going to work. So in some places, there are sort of natural monopolies of, of, of interoperable formats. Some monopolies are accretive because of, uh, they just get more valuable. Right, Facebook? I mean, no one's on Facebook because they like Facebook. Right? Nobody. We were all on Facebook because if we're not, we don't get invited to parties. <laughs> or whatever, right? We're on Facebook because the people we need to communicate are on, are on Facebook. And there is that. And everyone remembers the moment they had to join Facebook. Yeah. Right? And there was. There that where you said, God, eh, guess I have to join. Right? There was a thing that you couldn't do otherwise. I, mean, I am probably the only person still not on Facebook. And that's, I mean, okay, all right, that's right. But you know it has a social cost. Yeah. Right? There, there are things you don't know about in your friends' lives. There are social events you don't hear about. Yeah. It is a social cost. I notice it. I feel it. Right? I am ordinary enough to pay it, but that makes me three sigma and like, not a useful example. Uh, on the other hand, there is right, a lot of benefit to there being multiple sources of even social media platforms or of lock manufacturers or operating systems or phones or apps that there is more security in that diversity. And it, it's going to be some combination. Right? And different industries have different sweet spots uh, of where you, you draw that line. I don't know where it'll be from. It probably will be one line. It'll be different in, in, in different things. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for this fascinating and slightly scary talk. Um, I want to do a little bit of a dive into one of your examples, um, the hotel key problem. Um, I mean, pretty much everybody kind of gasped when you said you have to go to every lock to fix it. Um, but I had a completely different reaction, it's, which was that, well, every hotel employs people that go to every lock you know, pretty much every day, um, you know, to perform something you could consider a public health function, which is cleaning a room. Um, now, I'm sure the, you know, hotel lock industry isn't geared to have, um, you know, maids fixing locks, but why not? Anyway, um, it's, I think it's a good question. I mean, I, I think it's because the company never envisioned it. I mean, you could easily imagine were we here designing a better, you know, a, a better hotel lock. We would say, hey, right, we're going to need to do maintenance. We're going to need to do software updates. 
Let's make it so that you just plug a USB stick in. And, or maybe that's a bad idea, but can't pretend. <laughs> okay, all right. So, okay, so, so like Gen 1, right? Okay, let plug a USB stick in. Therefore, an unskilled person could do that, and you could integrate it into the normal life cycle of a hotel room instead of thinking, well, we designed it perfectly. Nothing bad can ever happen. We don't have to think about that. But yeah, so I think that's going to be when we think about failing safely, failing securely. Right, you know, ca you know what is going to be the the update mechanism, and and, and that's actually, that's a, uh, actually a really good idea. So maybe I right, don't make it a USB key, but you want to make it something that there isn't, or maybe maybe you know, we, we're going to mail the each hotel a specialized device, and that they're going to you know plug it in and push a button and maybe type a code and and it will you know push the software update. Yes, right, and, and I, but I think that is going to require. Some better engineering, and the you know the lock company isn't sophisticated. I mean, this is the, one of the problems with IoT devices. I mean, the reason this thing is secure is there's a team of engineers at Apple, and there's one at Microsoft and Google for their devices that are designing this to be as secure as possible in the first place. And when a vulnerability appears, they write a patch, they push it to my device. This thing improves. That lock was designed offshore by a third party by an engineering team that came together, designed it, dispersed. There's no group of engineers waiting to, 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 to patch it. And you know maybe that lock is patchable. Your router at home, the way you patch it is you throw it away and buy a new one. Right? That's the mechanism. There's no patching mechanism, let alone a team that could write the patch, which there also isn't. Now, throw it away and buy a new one is a valid security upgrade mechanism, right? We, the, we know this also is secure because every three to five years, we all get new devices. These things have a pretty fast churn. And the new iPhone, the new Windows, the new are, is better designed, more secure than the previous. Now, when you get to consumer goods, you do not have that. You buy a DVR, you're going to replace it in 10 years. You buy a refrigerator, you want it to last for 25 years. I bought a thermostat, new thermostat at my home last year. I expect to replace it approximately never. And we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to deal with that kind of life cycle. Or think of a car. You buy a car today. Let's say the software is two years old. You drive for 10 years, sell it. Someone else buys it. They drive for 10 years. They sell it. Probably gets put in a boat, sent to Latin America. Someone else buys it, drives another 20 years. OK, go home. Find a computer from 1976. <laughs> Boot it up. Try to run it. Try to make it secure. We actually have no idea how to secure 40-year-old systems at the consumer level. We have the faintest clue. Right? We have n so what do we, how do we make this work? Right? Option one is, is replace cars in the same life cycle as the phone. That won't work. That, that's actually going to literally cook the planet. Right? That is not going to be the answer. Is it going to be that Ford has to maintain a, a, a test bed of 300 makes and model years and test every patch? I, anyone who's an engineer is going to cringe at that notion. We don't know how to do that either. We're going to have to figure this out. Right? At, at the level of cars, the expensive things, at the level of these cheap things. You have a DVR. It could, be, could have been part of the Mirai botnet. And there was a really dumb vulnerability. One, you have no way of knowing. Two, you kind of don't care. And three, the only way we're going to remove that vulnerability is when you turn the thing off and throw it away. We're stuck. This is hard. We're approximately 40 days away from midterm elections, so if you could take everything you mentioned about uh, unique systems, uh, uh, disparate responses, and otherwise apply that uh, and maybe give a prognosis on our voting systems. So I've written a lot about voting and election systems. The good place for information is verifiedvoting.org. Uh, That's where I'll send people if you want to learn about what machines use in what jurisdictions, what vulnerabilities there are. Uh, I think there's a lot to be worried about. And the three areas that we have concern, concern of, of, the, of the computerized systems determine who's eligible to vote and where. That's our registration systems. 
there's the actual voting machines, and then there's the, si the computerized system that tabulates all those machines into a final result. All three are vulnerable in different ways. Uh, and we know that at least the first two were targeted at some level uh, by the Russian government in the 2016 U.S. election. Um, you know, it's hard to, to know what will happen. Certainly there are lots of vulnerabilities. I, I worry just as much about uh, appearances and reality. And this is important. Elections serve two purposes. The first one is to choose the winner. That's the obvious one. The second one is to convince the loser. Right? To the extent an election doesn't convince the loser, it has failed as a, as a democratic mechanism. And for the loser to say, that election wasn't fair, I didn't actually lose, we've lost, we, we don't, we've lost everything. So they need to be secure in appearance in addition to reality. And uh, don't know if anything will happen. You know, my guess is not just because it's, it's dangerous, propaganda is so much easier. But we don't know. I mean, lots of things have happened where we don't think it's enemy action, where we think it's uh, mistakes. I mean, there have been all sorts of weird mistakes. Machines have been opened up and there have been zero votes. Machines have been opened up that someone kind of got a negative number of votes. <laughs> you know, but those all seem to have been uh, mistakes, right? You know, the errors, not, not actual malicious action. So, so don't know, but hard. I want to. I want to hear what what Abby's thinking about this. You've been <laughs> sitting there about listening. voting. So, so what? I mean, like one of the questions I get from listening to Bruce speak is where kind of the locus of control, thank you, and, and responsibility lie. And the same question applies equally to kind of where's the public interest? Where does ethics reside in this system? Are you are you happy with the answer you're getting here, or what, what, what are we going to do about this? And where, where, where's your perspective on this? Well, in thinking, quick, call a philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in thinking about the the voting, I, I take Bruce's point really seriously about the sort of communicative role of the voting process. And uh, you know, we just this week in the New Yorker have a piece about you know Russia turning the election based on Facebook activity and a few targeted spaces, it looks like there's actually pretty good evidence that the election may have actually turned on social media kind of manipulation. It didn't need to be the voting machines, just as you were saying. And I think that um, as a philosopher, what you worry about is how can we manage all of these questions about what are we to do about our elections precisely when it's distributed and vulnerable in so many ways. It just becomes the kind of thing that we can't just say, oh, well, you know, we'll secure our elections. <laughs> it's, it's about how we're going to communicate about this and how, like, is it more worrying to really publicize these vulnerabilities than, it, you know, from a point of view of making our system go, or, you know, we think oh, we're already in a vulnerable moment for democracy. Do we think it's enough on the margins that we try to kind of not say too much? I mean, there are really very puzzling questions about what to do about this, this moment where things feel a little bit like they're teetering on a brink. The U.S. has two particular problems that other countries don't have. I mean, one, we don't have a bureaucracy to ensure the integrity of elections in the same way that other countries do. We re for security, we relied more on mutually distrustful parties watching each other. Right, you put a Democrat and a Republican at the table, and each will watch what the other does. And that was great for you know, mid-20th century threats. That was a reasonable security solution. It works less well today. Our second problem is we don't have one election. We have like 52 separate elections, and they're all very different, under different rules and different machines and different systems and different authorities. And we can't, you know, as a country, secure our elections. We don't, we don't, as a country, have an election. We kind of pretend we do. And those two things make it harder for the U.S. to do it than the U.K. or Australia or France or Japan or, you know, any other country that tries to run free and fair elections. And philosophers talk about the difference between 
ideal theory, which is like, what should things be like? And non-ideal theory, which is like, what do we do from where we are? And this feels like a moment <laughs> we are deep in the weeds of non-ideal theory. And there are striking puzzles about that. So I head there. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you were speaking about not blaming developers for unintended flaws, but uh, what about the growing industry of zero-day vulnerabilities that, has, that is another actor that is now like, playing a huge role? Right, so there is a market, right? There is a basically cyber war military industrial complex that has sprung up. And it has several tiers. It has major defense contractors selling cyber weapons to countries like the United States. It has these kind of mid-tier cyber arms manufacturers selling weapons to countries that we'd all agree probably shouldn't have them, like Kazakhstan and a Sudan and a uh, Uganda and uh, Mexico. I mean, all the countries you sort of hear, uh, Syria in the Citizen Lab reports, right? And there are, is there, there are people that sell cyber weapons to, to criminals. And there are markets in, in, in vulnerabilities, in attack tools, in, uh, in exploits. And one of the ways to judge how secure your system is is to look at the going price for a vulnerability in it. And, you know, which means if you've got an iPhone, you're doing pretty well. And if you've got an Android phone, you're doing less well because you know, uh, I think a good iPhone exploit is now worth half a million dollars. And, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's a, that market perturbs the world. Because if you are a software engineer, you can make a legitimate, this is not selling criminals. This is selling to actual companies that, you know, have offices and, and mailboxes and pay their taxes. You can sell an iPhone exploit to a, a cyber weapons arms manufacturer. It'll be used in ways you probably don't like, but maybe you don't have to look that carefully. And if you can, you know, get by the ethics, but, you know, vulnerabilities go that way. You, you send it to Apple and they'll give you a bounty of a few thousand dollars. And you probably you feel better for the world, but, you know, what's that worth? This is hard. And, and this sort of shows, again, how where we are is, is m making solutions harder. I mean, I argue in the book that we need to adapt the, the defense dominant strategy and say that defense has to win. The, the system is too important. Um, uh, what's his name? Blanking on name. He'll come to me in a second. Uh, Dan. Not Dan. No, I'm blanking on name. So I, I'll, I'll get the name in a second. Talks about that the U.S. should buy all vulnerabilities. We should, we should pay top dollar and buy everything. And then immediately give it to the defense. Right, then, uh, Dan Farmer. That we should, you know, that's what we should do. That that would be a smart use of our, our dollar. That buying them and using them for offense is actually a dumb use of our dollar. And letting other people buy them is also a dumb use. We should corner the market. Corner the market and, and, and destroy it. That's radical. But that's you know, an interesting way of thinking about it. And, and, and that is much more of a public health way of thinking about it. Right? If we can eradicate malaria you know, in, in, in Africa, that improves us here. That's not just foreign aid. That's you know, planetary health. That's a good idea. Right? If we can subsidize China to produce cleaner energy, that's not foreign aid. That's helping us here. I mean, come on, people. We're all in this together. And it's just a different way of thinking. Jim Geddes has been arguing that the best approach to dealing with some of these security issues is requiring uh, everything to be open, including firmware, uh, hardware specs, and software, and essentially the bizarre approach to ensuring or trying to ensure system security as opposed to the cathedral approach of trusting Apple or Google or the Chinese government to protect everybody. What do you think of that trade-off? You know, I, I, I don't think it's that's that important. I think things that are theoretically open are often practically not open. And I think there's some value in openness, but there's also value in proprietariness. I'm not convinced that that will make an appreciable change in security. It might make a change in other things. Right? It might be good for society in other ways that are broader than security. 
But for security, you know, Microsoft is actually has a, a really secure OS right now. They did a good job. I think they are more secure than Linux. That if you know, if you know what you're doing, you could you could do uh, right. But you know, and that's not because they're closed, but it just sort of shows that there doesn't necessarily have to be closed as worse. So I don't think I don't have an ideological dog in that fight. Although you can certainly argue from a lot of other social goods that openness is important. Certainly, if there's going to be an algorithm that will determine whether I uh, get released on bail, I think it's important for society if the algorithm be open. Right? If an algorithm uh, decided that I was uh, uh, drinking, right, a breathalyzer algorithm, I should be able to examine that source code and, and contest it in court. That just seems like a no-brainer. And that's, not, that's less security and more you know, public process. And, and because of what we learn again and again is when these algorithms are subject to scrutiny, they're, they're, you know, they're lousy. They're embarrassingly bad. They, they work at random occasionally. And you know, we, we have this bias to trust computers. I mean, we might not in this room, but you go outside this room, the computer is always right, is what people think. Because you know, it's a computer, of course it's correct. How could it be wrong? Right? It, it does calculations, it doesn't make mistakes. But you know, we can laugh, but that is not the prevailing opinion. Yeah, you know, but, but we, know how to, we know how to deal with that. And we can uh, put that algorithm in escrow. We can deputize uh, a commission who gets whatever, signs whatever agreements, and analyzes it, right? I mean, we all would accept that. I mean, we don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm going to, you know, go to uh, a reception tonight, and I'm not going to vet the food, right? But I know that there's an organization that did. Right, there were health codes and inspectors, and it all happened. So, so we can set up a system where somebody that we all trust looks at Google's search algorithm and makes sure it is not racist and sexist and otherwise biased or classist or you know, uh, subservient to Russian trolls. Whatever it is, whatever things we agree we don't like. We don't ha all have to look at it. Right? We can solve that. And it's not the, not the only time that we've had to, as a public, vet proprietary things. I think, I really think that's a bullshit argument. I might take the prerogative and ask the last question. So before we disappear out into the world, uh, what should we do? You've been thinking about this. Right, Who are we gonna lobby? What are we gonna write? What are we gonna study? What do we invest in? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something I'm working on <laughs> um, that I would like help with. <laughs> so maybe you could help me. I'm trying to think about how we um, educate people in different pieces of the process so that they can play a role in making these things better. So I'm working on a curriculum for engineers to help them identify and address ethical issues created by their work. I think that we need to think about um, I, there's a, a program I'm involved with at the Media Lab that's going to be about democratizing AI through K-12 education in AI so that all kinds of kids can grow up fluent with these tools. I think that we need to think long term about things like this, how we make it the case that all of us are more equipped to engage with these issues in the places where we find them, both as we encounter them in our lives and in our work and in our politics. So that I think is a crucial thing and also vote. I, I guess my answer is similar. I end my book with this call for getting policymakers and tech people to understand each other. Yeah. That not just my, not just cybersecurity, but pretty much all of the hard problems of this century, the hard policy problems are deeply technological. Right? AI, the future of work, climate change, food policy, and to the extent that we have policymakers and technologists talking past each other. Go watch the Facebook hearings. You want to see what, you know, what bad looks like. That we're just going to get terrible policy. And we'll get terrible tech. And so I love the idea of teaching programmers and engineers ethics. And I want to teach policymakers what software is like. And you know, we need to, to have this, this discussion across what you know, C.P. Snow calls the two worlds. You know, this is not a new problem. 
but it's become, I think, much more urgent. Uh, the going dark debate is all this talking past each other. The uh, going dark debate, uh, whether the FBI should be able to break into iPhones. Oh. Right? You know, that's all tech and policy talking completely fa past each other. And, and we need, you know, and this is places like Berkman. This is what we should be doing, is getting tech and policy together. Uh, we need technologists on congressional staffs, at federal agencies, at NGOs, in the press. You know, I am trying to teach computer security at the Harvard Kennedy School. Which I'm going the other way to try to get you know, policy people to understand tech. And you know, everybody's got to meet in the middle. And I, I, I think any long-term solution is, is going to include that. Great. This has been wonderful. So uh, buy a book. Bruce, are you willing to sign? I'm willing to sign. Excellent. And please join me in thanking Bruce and Abby. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.